curious just to learn a little about you guys before I start talking. And uh, hopefully you guys won't fall asleep during the next 45 minutes. But so how many of you are like entrepreneurship emphasis? I think that's an emphasis, right? Very cool. And, uh, so, and how many of you have like a business idea that you guys have considered doing at one point in your life? Okay, what are some of those ideas? Like, I'm curious to see what, what you guys have come up with, if you feel comfortable sharing, or if you're doing something right now. You, you look familiar, are you doing something right now? Uh, I don't know, I look familiar. No? Um, I'm building a resort in Fiji. You're doing a what, sorry? Building a resort in Fiji. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, and in the back? I'll go there. A what? I'll, I'll, I'll go there. You go there? Um, I, right now, I own a, an addiction firm where we uh, help some of the companies shift so we can for uh, high-level official CEOs. Okay, cool. Awesome. Anyone else want to share your, kind of your idea, what you're working on? Yeah. Yeah, I have an online uh, business. I, I sell shoes online and we purchase. Do you make them or you just resell uh, online? Or you import it from, are you from Mexico then? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. There you go. So um, just before I, I start talking, I just kind of want to just tell you a little bit about who I am, what I'm doing in my life, and hopefully you find something relevant for you to apply. I'm, ori I'm originally from Guatemala, and um, actually I pulled it up right here because I'm surprised to see how many people actually don't know where Guatemala is. So here you go. So we're right here, Utah, and Guatemala is right south of Mexico, right here. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Guatemala, around 75% of the total population in Guatemala is actually self-employed, which is extremely high. So growing up, there was no such thing as corporate America, right? I'm going to go to corporate. You just don't hear about that. You just hear about what are you going to do? What are you, how are you going to start your business next? So when I was uh, around um, 12, 13 years old, my father approached me. He was uh, very poor when he was younger, and so he, and then he just started some stuff. And he wanted me to be an entrepreneur as well. And he said, look, Daniel, here's 15 bucks, roughly. I will give it to you if you can double it in a month. All right, so that was the condition. So I sat in my room, and I started like, writing about a bunch of ideas that I had. And I still remember like, looking outside the window, and I saw my, I had a pet. I had a Labrador. It's, it's a dog, a pretty big dog. And I said, geez, I don't even need the 15 bucks to make money. What if I just have the Labrador, have puppies, and I resell, and I just sell those puppies, right? So I asked my mom, asked for permission to see if I can have my dog have puppies and resell them. She said, okay, fine, you can do that. So um, I, she had like eight puppies that once, and I sold them all. Uh, with that money, I bought more puppies, more actual dogs, a little bit bigger. And I started selling all the puppies that dogs were having. And uh, so that year, we ended up having around $200,000 in, in revenue. So roughly 100000 in profit, which was awesome, right? You're a 14-year-old guy, 13-year-old guy with 200000 bucks. So I was very, very excited, but my mom was not excited at all because her backyard was full of dogs. She had like 50 dogs in the backyard. <laughs> and uh, it was a mess. Like, you couldn't go outside. The kids couldn't go outside because all the dogs just attack them. And it was just... It was pretty bad. So I had to get, find a way to get rid of the dogs, so we sold a lot of the dogs. And then uh, from there, then we had to start thinking about different opportunities, something that we really liked. And I noticed that something that my brother and I were very passionate about was um, my mom's cinnamon rolls, because they were really good, we thought. So we said, man, what if we can just sell the cinnamon rolls? So we, uh, I, uh, I had my mom make a, a dozen of cinnamon rolls. I took some to, to school. And sure enough, people really liked it. Actually, they liked it so much, they were willing to find 10 cells and then uh, with the condition that I give them a free cinnamon roll. So all of a sudden, I had a little sales team uh, within my, <coughs> in my school. And I had five guys selling cinnamon rolls like the whole day at school. And, uh, and I gave them like three cinnamon rolls at the end of the day just because they sold a lot of cinnamon rolls. And at one point, I remember like we still, I w used to walk with like three huge like garbage bags full of boxes with cinnamon rolls in it. And uh, the little store started complaining because they were decreasing in sales quite a bit, the store inside school. So they shut me down, right? So that was pretty rude, they shut me down, but we knew we had a product that was pretty good, we thought. And so we started distributing it in, in um, what's the Starbucks of Guatemala, it's called Cafe Gitane. Uh, uh, have any of you been in Guatemala before? You still have a mission there or something? Cool, anyone else? 
So I don't know if you're from Africa, Vegeta, and they sell coffee, but we start supplying cinnamon rolls for them, and we became one of the largest distributors of cinnamon rolls in Central America, which there was no competition. That's why we were the largest ones, right? <laughs> so it's just cool to say that. Uh, but then Cinnabon actually entered the market in Guatemala, and that just completely killed us, it just destroyed us and just eradicated us from the market. So then uh, I started a couple other things, sold some companies, failed in a ton of them. And then I came to the US with the idea that I can learn how to grow more scalable businesses, right? The dogs was fun and it brought some cash, but I wanted to grab something a little more scalable, right? Something that I could just grow and sell, hopefully. If not, just grow and just make a lot of money off of it. So I came to, uh, um, I learned English five years ago in Texas, and then I came to Brigham University and I studied business strategy and I took a lot of entrepreneurship classes, which was very, very exciting uh, for me. The interesting thing is in entrepreneurship major, uh, Brigham University, they really push for what is the ideal business, right? So I, I'm curious to see what you guys think. What is the ideal business for you? Like if you think about just what would the most amazing business in the world be? How would that look like? What do you guys think? Something with technology, okay. Cool, why technology, by the way? Scale. Yeah, Scale. Yeah, it's cool, so, yeah, no cost, right? So you build something once, and you can sell a billion times that same product. You don't have to make it over and over again, like cinnamon rolls. I have to wake up at 1 a.m. to make those cinnamon rolls, right? So it's a little more scalable. You raise your hand there in the back. Uh, something that sells while you're sleeping. Okay, okay, yeah, something that you go to bed, you wake up, and you made like two million bucks, hopefully, yeah. Cool, okay. You know, if it's technology, great. Sales, obviously, great. Yeah. Cool. So passion has a big play into this, yeah. right, for you. And then technology, something that is selling and sleeping. Anyone else want to put it, something out there? Yeah. Something that people can buy constantly. Recur some recurring sales, basically. Okay, cool. Some kind of like software as a service, right? So you buy this subscription and you pay monthly. So you just have to sell once and then you make money for the rest of your life from that guy. Cool, so they pushed me, they pushed for all that stuff in the business school, which uh, was very interesting for us because coming from a business background, no one in the business school has any skills. No one has any skills. Meaning no, no, no one has hard skills, right? People can network, people can talk, people can build a resume, but no one knew how to build any technology. I didn't know how to build a website, right? How, do I, how am I supposed to sell a software as a service type of thing, right? I knew what I, I actually didn't even know what I was passionate about. I had no idea, I still don't know what I'm passionate about. But uh, there is no way, and I remember talking to a lot of my friends and they all had awesome, crazy business ideas and no one could build absolutely anything, which drove me nuts, right? In reality, it's like, that's, that's kind of stupid in my mind. So I graduated this last December and uh, I walked into uh, Brigham University's um, Entrepreneurship Center and I said, you know what, I have an idea for a class that I wanna teach here. I wanna create the whole curriculum, teach a class where students run every single aspect of a company given their really hard skills, instead of just sitting there and, and listening, which is a great thing to do, by the way. But I wanted our students to just get engaged and do something, you know, it's a more exciting, get their hands a little dirty. And uh, I was actually very amazed that they said, yeah, let's do it. So two weeks after I graduated as an undergrad, I became adjunct professor at Brigham University teaching entrepreneurship, which was, it's just unheard of, right? But uh, I really, to be honest, I had no idea what I was doing. So I called a friend, his name is Jeff Shorting. He was supposed to be here today, but he's in California on a trip. And I said, Jeff, what are you working on? And Jeff had started a couple of businesses in the past and sold some of them out while he was in school. And he said, well, I'm just looking for my next business opportunity, you know? And he's like, what are you up to? And I said, well, I'm teaching this class at BYU. And he said, what are you teaching on? And I told him kind of the premise of the whole thing. And, uh, and I was like, Jeff, I need your help. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, do you want to teach this with me? And he's like, yeah, I'll jump on board. So we start teaching uh, the world's first crowdfunding class in taught in higher education, which Stanford teaches a crowdfunding class, but is in for like in the visual arts, for media, how to record videos and stuff like that. But I started, record, I started teaching it as an, uh, from an entrepreneurship perspective. So um, who here has heard of Kickstarter or crowdfunding or things like that, most of you? Okay, what is Kickstarter? What is crowdfunding, just in a sentence? What do you guys think? What is it? Who can explain that for me, for us? Anyone? A place to put your idea and ask for 
funds uh, to get that the, the startup money to go ahead and start production or build the product or build the technology or whatever you're, you're trying to do. Yeah. And then once you're there, you they get a return on their money somehow. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that's 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 great explanation, right? So you put an idea or a product out there, and you're looking for funds. You give them something in return for, in exchange for some type of revenue. I'm going to give you a couple of examples here in a little bit, but first I want to tell you why that is incredible. Why that's an incredible method. I've run this um, this workshop with literally over 3,000 people already, and uh, I brought I copied it from this guy that gives a TEDx talk. And I kind of want him to explain what it is, and because he does a great job at it. Several years ago, here at TED, Peter Stillman introduced the design challenge called the Marshmallow Challenge. And the idea is pretty simple. Teams of four have to build the tallest freestanding structure out of 26 of spaghetti, one yard of tape, one yard of string, and a marshmallow. The marshmallow has to be on top. And though it seems really simple, it's actually pretty hard because it forces people to collaborate very quickly. And so I thought this was an interesting idea and I incorporated it into a design workshop and it was a huge success. And since then I've conducted about 70 design workshops across the world with students and designers and architects, even the CTOs of the Fortune 50. And there's something about this exercise that reveals very deep lessons about the nature of collaboration and I'd like to share some of them with you. So, Normally, most people begin by orienting themselves to the task. They talk about it, they figure out what it's going to look like, they jockey for power, then they spend some time planning, organizing, they sketching, they lay out spaghetti. Uh, they spend the majority of their time assembling the sticks into ever-growing structures, and then finally, just as they're running out of time, someone takes out the marshmallow, and then they gingerly put it on top, and they stand back, and ta they admire their work. But what really happens most of the time is that the ta-da turns into an uh-oh, because the weight of the marshmallow causes the entire structure to buckle and to collapse. So there are a number of people who've had a lot more uh-oh moments than others. And among the worst are recent graduates of business school. <laughs> it's amazing. They lie, they cheat, they uh, get distracted, they, and they produce really lame structures. And of course, there's teams that have a lot more ta-da structures, and among the best are recent graduates of kindergarten. <laughs> and it's pretty amazing, as Peter tells us. Uh, not only do, do they produce the tallest structures, but the most interesting structures of them all. So the question you want to ask is, how come? Why? What is it about them? And Peter likes to say that none of the None of the kids spend any time trying to be CEO of Spaghetti Inc., right? They don't time, spend time jockeying for power. But there's another reason as well. And the reason is that business students are trained to find the single right plan, right? And then they execute on it. And then what happens is when they put the marshmallow on top, they run out of time, and what happens? It's a crisis. Sound familiar, right? Okay, what kindergartners do differently is that they start with the marshmallow and they build prototypes, successful prototypes, always keeping the marshmallow on top. So, so this is awesome. Seriously, if there's one thing that you should remember out of today is you need to be the kindergarten student, not the business student. So when, uh, when and the reason why I bring this up is because when you're running an, an innovative startup, right, something that maybe hasn't been done before, you, you built this whole thing with a lot of assumptions, right? Which I'm sure you guys already heard of it. But one of the most critical assumptions is if your business is new and it hasn't been done before, is that people actually care enough to buy it, right? You think that people buy it, but you have no idea if people are gonna buy your product or not, right? So a lot of times, because we've been trained in business, to, in business schools to just find the ultimate solution to an answer, we just execute. Right? We spend months, if not years, of our lives looking uh, for, to develop our product. We look for some investors. We talk to our mom, say, Mom, I have this idea. Do you have some money that I can borrow to start my business? Mom says, of course, you're my son. Here's some money. Right? Two years later and a couple of thousand bucks later, they try to sell and put it out there and find out that no one, no one wants to buy their product. A great example of this is, um, is, this, wa is this water called Pet, pet something. They, someone tried to do a water, water bottle for uh, pets. 
And he said, of course, you know, the water bottle industry is, is extremely hot right now, right? It's super popular, it's making billions of dollars. So why not grab those bottles and just sell it for dogs and cats? So they went through like two years of development. They bought, they bought a plant, they got a couple million dollars in investing money. They p dumped it all into resources. Two years later, they, got, they landed some deal with like PetSmart or something like that. They put it in the shelves and they find out that actually no one wanted to buy it. I mean, so, sure some people bought it, but very, 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 very few. So it was a huge failure, right? And they spent two years of their lives and millions and bucks trying to find out if someone will buy it. They were following this process, right? Think about this, when you go to a test, right? And there's multiple solution answers, right? There's A, B, C, D, and the right one is C, right? There's always one right solution to a question. And that's what, what we've been trained on doing, right? So you execute on that. And then chances of you actually failing is extremely high. Versus following um, the process that kindergarten students have followed, which is basically, well, you don't know if someone's gonna buy your product, so why don't you try to test that right now, right? So for the water bottle example, a great, a great way to test to see if people will actually buy it is you grab a water bottle, you change the, the layout or just, put, just print your own logo on it, just put like water for pets. You go and walk into like PetSmart, you put the bottle on the shelf and you just sit there and you see if someone will actually buy it or not. And if someone grabs it, then you grab it, it's like you interview them, right? It's like, hey, why'd you buy that thing, right? And then you just take it from there, right? But you can test those critical assumptions today with whatever your business is. You can test it today to see if it's going to work, if people are going to transact and actually pay for something. So um, once again, the reason why I love crowdfunding and Kickstarter is because it allows you to, to grab an idea, a product, a prototype, and test to see if people will buy it like right here, very, very, very early on. And let me give you uh, an example of someone who has done that extremely well. I want all of you to close your eyes real quick. No one looks at the screen. OK, you can look now. Here's a Kickstarter video of someone pitching this Here's the gear tie I designed. I call it the thing. Bone. It's specifically designed for paracord. You use it by taking a piece of cord, putting it along the spine, and then you wrap it once, twice, and pull through the tail. And it's held just like that. When you get to the other side, you'll wrap it around the head and it'll stay in place by friction. I'll show you right now. I'm going to lash a couple sleeping bags together and show you how this works. We're just going to hook it into the head of the fishbone. Right, you get the idea, right? It's just a little thing that allows you to... I don't, actually, I don't know exactly what it is, but you get the idea. Here's the cool part. That, that's not the cool part. Here's the cool part. Hello, I'm Brent. Thanks for clicking on our project. Right now, this is the only one. Could you guys hear that? Right now, this one is the only one. And someone interviewed him and asked him, like, how much did it cost you to make this prototype? He said, like, 11 bucks. It cost him, he put $11 in, made a video, took some pictures, put some text, put it on Kickstarter, and in 30 days, 30 days later, he made $89,000 worth of revenue direct revenue, which accomplishes, accomplishes a lot of things. But one of the things it accomplishes is that now he has all the cash in his hands to actually manufacture and produce the orders that he got. And basically, this is pre-orders, right? There's 3,050 people that pre-order one of those little fish bones, right? He put 11 bucks in and took $90,000 out in 30 days, right? Isn't this incredible? It is incredible, right? All right, good. Yeah, you have a question? Um, yeah, is there, do you have a website that lists um, prototype companies or companies that only focus on building prototypes for like, such a price? No, but it's uh, any manufacturer really builds prototypes, right? Because you just ask for a sample. So, for example, if you're making T-shirts, you walk into a T-shirt printing business and say, hey, you want I have this logo, can you just print one? And it'll be like, yes, it's going to be super expensive because it's only one. You say, okay, fine. You get that one, and then you try to pre-sell it, right? Or if you're doing something with technology, you contact a manufacturer in China, for example, try to get a sample from them. Once you get the sample, you can, you can uh, start taking pre-orders. Does that make sense? So let me give you an example of some stuff we've done. We've done like 20 projects uh, in the last 10 months, and we're always trying to hack to see how the system works. But here's one that, that we worked on actually fairly recently. 
Mm-mm. Yeah. When you say that you've done, is this something that you and Jeff have, have invented and put out there, or you're working as a consultant? Or uh, we're, we're working on a lot of stuff right now. Yeah. But uh, this website is not ours. This is not our site. But we've done projects. We put them on Kickstarter, see how they do, so understand, to understand the process. So entrepreneurs come to you, and then you guide them through that process. Yeah, we can do that too. Or we just do it without anyone coming to us. So here's an example of someone, something that Jeff really wanted. For some reason, he said, you know, I hate all the calendars because you have to be flipping pages, and I want to see the whole year just in a big line because I want to know where my next deadline is and uh, see visually how much time I have between uh, my deadlines, right? So he, uh, we created this, went to a printing shop, and they gave us this one <laughs> super long. This is super long. It's this big. Um, sample. And um, we took some pictures, put it on Kickstarter. So that cost us like 15 bucks to make. And then 30 days later, we made $25,000, $26,000 in revenue. And it's super simple. You just go in and say, here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Please support my project. And if people like it, they'll support your project. If people don't like it, they won't support your project. Yeah? So just a couple questions, I guess, on how it works. So you say you need $1,000. Do you get the money no matter what, or only if it reaches the goal? Okay. Those are great questions. So let me give you kind of the very, very basics of how Kickstarter works, although there's other crowdfunding platforms. Kickstarter specifically, you have to choose a couple of variables that, um, that you control. One is your funding goal. It could be as little as a dollar or as much as you know, 40 million bucks. It doesn't matter what your goal is. You completely choose whatever that goal uh, ha- want, you want it to be. And then you choose your time. Usually. Um, we recommend doing 30-day campaigns, but you can go as high as 60 or 65 or something like that, and as low as like two days or a day, if, even if you want to. So you choose uh, your time frame, your goal, and then the rewards. So you say, hey, for one calendar, uh, it's going to cost you 35 bucks plus 19 dollars if you're outside of the United States. Does that make sense? So one person, so they can play the Uh, usually, usually they just choose one of these rewards that you have right here, right. but they can give you like two thousand bucks and to get ten calendars or something like that. So you all, you get a reward for money. And so what if you want thirty thousand dollars and you only get twenty five? Do you not give the money then, or? That's a great question. With Kickstarter, it's all or nothing. So if you don't hit your goal, okay. you don't get the money. But the credit cards are never charged for your customers. You never see the money. You're not obligated to perform. It's kind of like deals off. Which is amazing, right? Because if, you ha- if you're working with a physical product, usually you have minimum order quantities from your manufacturer, right? And they say, we can do this, but we can, we'll do it only if you uh, buy 10,000 units, right? So now you have your, your goal, you know, it's 10,000 times 10, whatever, and that's, that's your goal, whatever your price is. In this case, we could do it super low. We didn't have to have any, any large minimum order quantities. So it protects, it protects the project creator because if you don't hit that goal, you don't have enough cash to produce it, right? So it's, it's so incredible. So you give the cash, you send out the calendars, you produce them, that's the only thing? So if you get the cash and you don't send out the calendars, is there, how does that work? Yeah, so if you hit your goal by that timeline, two weeks later, Kickstarter deposits all the money in the bank account. So uh, tomorrow we're gonna get 26,000 bucks in our bank account, just like that. And then now we have all the cash to fulfill all the orders. So it reverses that process, right? Usually yeah. in business, you have to have like 5,000 units from your manufacturer and then try to sell it one by one over time, hopefully praying that someone please will buy your product, right? Versus this, you know exactly how many we need to order from our manufacturer. We need to order 624 calendars. Exactly, that's what it is. And if you're doing something with fashion, it's amazing, right? Because if you're doing t-shirts or something like that, or shoes, there's different sizes, there's different, different type for men or women, and, you, and if you have an online store, you have to have everything in stock. You have to have medium size, small size, extra large, large, everything. And you don't know what's going to sell. Versus pre-orders, you know exactly how many extra large you need, how many mediums, how many smalls, what type of shirts, and you just fulfill exactly. It's extremely lean. Yeah, you had a question. So what happens to the, the excess funding if there is any, if you don't have as many batches or orders um, desired for the product that you end up with a lot of pledge? What happens with the excess money if you can't deliver? Oh. If, the, if there isn't a balance desire between the number of backers that you currently Oh, say like, okay, that, that wasn't impressive enough. I don't want to pursue it. What I do with my profits, everything? Yeah. No, you said that I think 
think one of the things, that, from what I understand, is that you purchase something. You're not just pledging money freely. You're saying, I'm going to buy 10 calendars. And so if you end up with $10,000 extra at the end, that's your profit. You yeah. Really bought something from you. you buy burgers, whatever you want to do with it. Calendar costs you 10 bucks. In fact, the calendar costs us two bucks to make, and we're selling it at 35. So that's great, right? So it gives us extremely high margins. But uh, we choose whatever we want to do with the profits. If we want to put the profits into keep building a business, we do that. If we want to just eat burgers for the rest of the year, we eat burgers. <laughs> yeah. So I'm assuming the Kickstarter has to make some type of money from yes. this. Do they get a percentage of your sales, or how does that work? Great questions. Um, the Kickstarter takes 5%. Amazon Payments, they're the one that transact the takes all the credit card information, take another 5%. So it, it's as low as 8%, but I'll plan on just losing 10% of your total revenue. Oh, total. total revenue. Okay. So we won't see like 22,600 bucks off of this. We just don't see it, they just take it. So you just have to take, take into consideration that for your, for your margins. Great questions, I'm more than happy to help. Like, actually, I would rather keep going with the questions if you guys want, versus me just so, running, so yeah. So you scale this, so you have an idea of what people mm -hmm. who use Kickstarter do. So how, what's your idea for scaling this? Like, so for example, I don't know how many people look at that, but if they want to buy it, how do you go scale? What's your strategy moving forward? That's an awesome question. So with this one, uh, Kickstarter, once again, if you look at the marshmallow, it tests the most, it tests the most critical assumption, which is do people actually want to buy this, right? So we walked into um, a retailer with this, with a calendar in our hands, and we said, we want, uh, we want you to pr purchase order for your store, and they said, I don't like it. And we said, well, it made 26,000 bucks in 30 days. And he said, I like it, <laughs> right? And then he was like, well, I'm a little concerned about the price because we usually sell our calendars here for 10 bucks. And we said, well, ours are paying 35 bucks online. So he's like, I love it. So he put a big purchase order from us, right? So because- it gives you a, your platform to sell on. Yeah, so now you go in. So after you do this, you go into a retailer and say, Here's my new innovative idea. We just made 30,000 bucks in 30 days and people are paying triple the price that you will be charging like in your store. And then for them, for retailers, it also eliminates that risk, right? Because they take a huge risk. They give you a purchase order, they buy your product, they give you a check and they buy it and they take the risk that hopefully someone will actually buy it from them, right? So if you can, in their mind, eliminate that risk and they know that there's a demand for your product, that's incredible value add for, for, the, for the retailer because they're not assuming a huge risk in their minds, right? Because they know that people want it. It's just a matter of, do enough people are gonna walk in to see the calendar to actually buy it. Yeah? Who are all these buyers and stuff that are on the Kickstarter? Who are these people that go on there looking for a random product? Yes. Who are they? So, um, they're probably people like you. They're uh, mostly male. Uh, graduate from college, they have a job, and they're rich with no kids, mostly. Uh, there's still the, there's quite a bit of women there, uh, but it's more towards people like you with a lot of money. I don't. If you have a lot of money, then it's exactly like you. If not, then like you with a lot of money. So uh, so people are browsing consistently. In fact, I can I can show you some stats to check this out. So are they just people who are wanting to have the the, the newest thing first? Like, because they're not, they're not getting a percentage of your company. They're not investing saying, no. oh, I want to get 10%. They're just, I want to have the, the newest cool thing the first. Yeah, and this calendar is not available anywhere else in the world. So they're willing to wait a um, couple months for us to, to fulfill it. So here's an idea of the power of doing Kickstarter versus Indiegogo or other crowdfunding platforms out there, is that Kickstarter actually drives quite a bit of traffic. So the green is how much revenue came from Kickstarter. The gray is how much traffic we drove to our page to actually get some sales. So we got featured, and we try to get featured. We got featured in this big blog called Fast Company. So they featured this. Uh, but the rest came from Kickstarter, right? So people are browsing it. They've kind of built this community where people are gonna see what's new, what's cool, what can I support um, that is kind of innovative and creative, right? And, um, but you still have to do a lot of the marketing, right? Most of the projects we do, we just put it out there, just see what happens. And, uh, but usually they don't pass over 35,000 bucks. So it's kind of at the floor, but if you do a little bit more of um, of marketing, you can you can explode there. Yeah, you had a question now. Yeah. How do you determine your pledge goal? Because sometimes I notice is this a thousand? I can't really tell if that's good. My goal, yeah, is a thousand bucks. So like, is that what you put on Kickstarter? But in reality, you wanted to get like ten thousand. Uh huh. How do you determine the amount? 
that's 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 uh, really up to you. How much is how much you want uh, your product to actually worth it for you? A little hack. This is too granular. So if it's too too granular, just stop me. But we chose a thousand dollar goal because people find your product when they click on discover and they see these tags right here. And they want to see which one's the most funded small projects, and then soon, you know, which ones have projects have recently launched. But there's this category called small projects, which are projects that, um, that are raising a thousand bucks or less in 30 days or less and have a video. So if, you have a, if you're raising a thousand bucks or less and uh, you have a video and your time frame is 30 days, you're automatically put in into this category in addition to whatever, whatever category you're in as well. So we usually see like an additional 14% of in additional sales from being in the small category. So it's just a little hack, but. It's, the idea is you want to you know want to see get as many eyeballs as possible on your project, yeah. But is that also possibly like as you have you as you've done these twenty eight projects, have you seen that that has affected it when you tried to say my goal is a thousand, even though like they realize that you're at a hundred thousand dollars or whatever else? Does that affect you and say ah? No. Why they only want a thousand? They're just trying to get. No, because we we haven't done any anything like super breakthrough. So the calendar is just a piece of paper. It's a long piece of paper. Right? We did it actually in Excel in like one day and just print it and that's it. But uh, if we were, for example, doing like, I don't know, a satellite that is going to go around the moon and I don't know, something like that, and you say your goal is a thousand bucks, yeah, that's going to hurt your credibility because there's no way you can do that for a thousand bucks, right? Versus a piece of paper, a thousand bucks is super credible and if people want it, it won't hurt them. It won't hurt them. Yeah. Uh, yes? So is there a way for, for investors that think, wow, they, they go on Kickstarter, they see that you have this great idea, and they say, you know what, I want to buy 25% of your company, and I think it's worth this. Is there a way for them to contact you to get oh. involved that way? Yeah, people, people can contact, in fact, let's... Or do they just purchase the product, and that's their way of getting involved? No. So let me show you some cool projects. Someone here made a board game um, with zombies and raised 2.2 .2 million bucks. Right. Here's the game. Pretty cool, huh? 2.2 million dollars, right? So once you go with investors and you say, yeah, in fact, that wasn't the only project they did. They did eight projects. First one raised 781,000. Next one, 951,000. Next one, 909,000. 116, half a million, 2.2 .2 million. 356. So they're not, and this is in the last year. So this yeah. these guys right here made probably like four million bucks in the last year. So if, if, let's say I'm an investor. And yeah. I you know, have all this money that I want to go invest and actually become part owner of this company. Yeah. You can contact them right here. Okay. So they have a contact form. Usually they have a link to your site, which there should be like some type of contact information. Blah blah blah. So yeah, they they can contact you. Usually when you're approaching investors, though, you you want to be the one approaching them. Because if an investor is, I don't know, you just want to be careful with who you want to have on board. And so even if I have, get approached by an investor, for example, with a calendar that did $30,000, an investor says, I'm in, I don't trust the investor. Because I, I, I don't know. But there's a way to contact, that people contact you. Yeah. Yeah, you said you got featured on Fast Company. How did you do that? Do you just email them and say, hey, please feature me? Yeah. And they like your product and feature you. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. So we, uh, I was going to get into this, which we don't have to, but we're all, all these products that we're launching are actually very small for us. We don't do that full time. We just do it because we just love the whole concept and we just try to hack Kickstarter as much as possible. And we always come up with new products ideas. But we run this site called Prefundia and uh, we got featured in TechCrunch as well. And uh, just a little tip for blogs that, that could be extremely helpful for you is for if you want to get featured in big blogs, Right? Trying to get in the mindset of the people who are going to feature you. Right? They're huge, and what they really care about is awesome, legit new content. So when you're approaching these big blogs, go and approach them with some exclusive material. So for Fast Company, we give them like awesome pictures, and we give them some exclusivity on some information that no one else in the world had. Right? So now they have information that their second competitor, for example, if I'm TechCrunch, if I'm approaching TechCrunch and I'm giving some information, that you know, they have information that Mashable wouldn't have, right? Other blogs wouldn't have that information because I give them some exclusivity and they love that. 
And the other thing, so new pictures that aren't on your Kickstarter page is a great way to do it. For any type of business, the second thing I'll say to an approaching bloggers is make sure that your title is incredible. I've heard a rumor that some people at TechCrunch, some bloggers spend like 80, 90% of their time writing the title and 10% of the time writing the actual article. Um, because people, that's how people browse you. You're Googling stuff or you'll see the, t the title is the biggest thing for them. So when we approached uh, Fast Company, we said something like the linear calendar, 2,156% funded or something like that, right? So it was like, whoa, you know, because our goal was so low that it looked like a huge deal. But it, in fact, it wasn't such a big deal, right? It was just 26,000 bucks. But that, that title, because they had a, a pretty powerful title, they clicked on it and they were like, oh, cool, you know, I want to write it. The other thing as well for this one, they didn't choose that title, but our title was Prefundia um, crushes Kickstarter success rate by 200% and crushes Indiegogo success rate by 956% or something like that. So it was kind of like, we are killing Kickstarter, we're killing Indiegogo, and that made them open our, our, our uh, press release and they picked it up and they featured it. Yeah? So going back to maybe your class, Put something out there and get it going if you don't have that. So say if you built um, an instrument, then you can't you can't throw out that in the instrument. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we have, I don't know if this is the best thing for you, but when our students come in, we we're talking a little about scalability and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They come in our class, they actually don't have any business ideas or product ideas when they walk into our class. Okay. We give them one week to come up with ideas, one week to prototype it, and then they launch it in week three. So it's, it's super fast paced. But when, we, when they come in, they have this big mentality of, oh, I'm gonna create the next like, social network thing that, you know, whatever. And we said, if you can't do it today, you just cannot do it. And that's what we tell them. If you can't do it today, don't do it. At least for the class, just don't worry about it. Just do something else. Do something that you can do today. So an example of something that we did in our class is they were thinking about, well, what can I do today? I, don't ha I have no skills, right? I'm, a, I'm a business major, right? I know how to talk to people, but I, I don't know how to build cool stuff. So this uh, guys right here actually, um, he, one of them was reading Wikipedia, and they saw there was a cool Viking game. Cube. Cube, yeah. Yeah, it's a cool uh, Viking game and all that stuff. And uh, they said, well, I haven't seen one around here. What if we just put it on Kickstarter, right? The game has been around here for like, 2,000, 1,000 years or something like that. It's, it's, not, it's not anything new. So the guy went to his dad's wood shop, asked his dad to help him out, made this 12 pieces of wood and raised 31,000 bucks, right? So it's, uh, it's uh, he just picked it up like that pretty simple. So, so I mean, but for your class, you talk if you want small, cheap projects that can mm -hmm. quick. Okay. For our class, yes, because we are huge um, fans of what we call doing accessible innovations. Right? Do something innovative, but it is accessible to you, right? So now this semester, we've got some industrial designers in our class, which can make cool stuff. So now the quality of our products are actually increasing because what's accessible to our students is way more powerful than it was last semester. Is this, a, this is an undergrad class, or can you take it in the MBA program? Uh, anyone can take it, but we're, we're not pushing. F I don't like MBAs. So we're just pushing undergrads right now. <laughs> No, I like, I like MBAs. I like MBAs, but no, I like them. But we're just pushing undergrads. <laughs> just don't put that on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, well, the reason, the, well, the reason why I say I don't, I don't like MBAs for a class perspective is, once again, they usually, most of them, at least at BYU, they come from a corporate background where they're just, they're like, okay, tell me what to do. Boom, they execute it. And uh, they give a report and Excel sheets and they talk a lot. And I, well, I want someone that, who is just, who just wants to try something out and just wants to make something happen right now, which is out much, too much thought. So. Cool, all the questions. I wanna see, I wanna make sure that I answer any questions that, that you have to take the most out of this time, yeah. What if you learn to reach the goal that you have, what then happens to you? Do you get charged for, for the percentage? If you reach your goal, if you don't reach, you don't reach the goal. If you don't reach the, okay, so if you don't reach the goal, um, then none of the credit cards from the backers are charged. They don't give you the money, and you're not obligated to perform. Credit cards still charge you? No. That's 
So they make money if you make money. If you don't make money, they don't make money. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's all free. There's no risk. Yeah. Do the backers get some sort of email saying, hey, your purchase was canceled? Yeah. In fact, I can probably show you some emails that I, that I got in. Um, unsuccessful. I don't know how to spell it successfully. I don't know how to spell unsuccessful, guys. But anyways, they just say, they just say the project has been unsuccessfully funded. Sorry. That's it. Yeah. So you, you never get charged. Yeah. Do we have the potential of losing money if they take 10% and you and we end up with a thousand and one hundred dollars or whatever? Or uh, for example, this one, if he sells sixteen hundred dollars pledge, and he ends up with less money because you would calculate that out probably. Yeah, you, figure out you just bill it into your margins. You have to plan ahead. So, you, so as long as you build your margins, you cannot lose. Okay. Well, you can lose, and let me show you some examples. Here's a, a great example. Have you guys heard of so phone soap? No. Some BYU guys. It's raised 63,000 bucks, and uh, once they got the money, they find out that they cannot fulfill this, that they can't manufacture. So they go back and forth with manufacturer, and they finally get a sample from them that they like, and the new iPhone comes out. And so all these new backers, they had a new iPhone that wasn't gonna be compatible with their product, so they have to go back and manufacture again. And it's a big mess. And this happened, um, let's see, when did it happen? See the time there? Hmm, I don't know. This happened a couple of years ago, actually. What are you seeing that? There you go. It's so obvious that I can't see it. May 2nd, 2012, and, uh, and they still haven't shipped their product. Oh, it's just a, it's a way to clean your, the bacteria off of your phone. So apparently, Phones are super gross. Uh, phones are dirty. There you go. Ordinary cell phones, just like the one you have, swab them for germs and find out what's living there. The results are in. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Super oh, hardcore. So, so uh, um, this is a way to clean it. It has like some, some, I don't know what it is. But it just cleans it while you're sleeping. It just charges and, and cleans it. But they, they got a backfire on them because they, cannot, they still can't ship their product. And it's been over a year. And all the backers are super angry. And they're like, oh, you're a scam and all that stuff. And uh, it, could, it could get pretty bad if you don't. How, you how feel. does Kickstarter try to control that? Because I mean, you could pretty much just yeah. up there and just take money. Kickstarter, Kickstarter controls it um, from trying to prevent things like that. So getting into Kickstarter is actually a very difficult process. It's simple if you just follow every step. But there's a lot of steps. There's a lot of things they're looking for. They want to make sure that you are a legitimate person. So when you're actually um, connecting with Kickstarter, uh, I don't know how they do this. But every time I've done it, they ask me questions about my mom, like where I lived in the past four years. It's crazy. And they know if, I, if I'm me or not. So and so, if you fulfill the order, the backers can then go through yeah. Kickstarter. No, Kickstarter does not sue you. So these guys... Uh, they didn't fulfill it, but hey, you know, now they run out of cash trying to get a sample, and they still haven't put the order for their 1,200 backers. And what would prevent somebody from just not even sending it out, just taking the cash? Nothing. So Kickstarter won't do anything, but the one thing is, if people really get angry at you, if there's quite a bit of backers, they'll probably create like a union and sue you together. Um, but for sure, now they cannot get their business out at all. This business is dead. There's no way that they can get this out there because so there's just so, so much bad. How does your candidate just give the money back or are they already in the hole? Because they tried to you can give the money back. The problem is Kickstarter does not give you the money back. So they take 10%. So if you give the money back, you automatically lost 10% of whatever you did. So in this case, they would have lost $6,307. Something like that. Yeah. Are there any kind of algorithms on Kickstarter to get Yeah, in fact, we build our whole um, Prefundia that I kind of mentioned briefly. These are products that are about to launch on Kickstarter, and we build this page. We're going to um, get out of crowdfunding here pretty soon, um, but we build it because it's super important to 
get a lot of backers day one to be in the most popular algorithm. So I'm not going to go into detail, but you can read it, prefundia.com, hacking Kickstarter's popular algorithm. We, um, we did a couple of different tests, and we launched a couple ones, and we got our calendar in the most popular for that week. And so and here's the research of how to get in the most popular. You can go ahead and read that. It's once again, prefundia.com slash blog, and there's the algorithm. Yeah. What have you learned about scalability? What have I learned that um, um, I still want to do tech? I, th I do still think tech is, um, is pretty scalable, mm -hmm. although there is, um, there's some questions about that. Actually, last week I was in Hawaii and running an event, Build Your Hawaii there, and uh, I talked to someone who's selling hair and makes $150 million of profit each year. So is that scalable? It is, right? But it's just selling hair. It's nothing tech. But I still think tech is, is, uh, is a big deal for, for me. I still, want, I still want to push that. And I think that's what's scalable. But we were big fans of accessible innovation. So I started teaching the class. We were hoping that our students would make 100 bucks in revenue. They made close to $40,000, $45,000 in revenue. So that was awesome. We leveraged that into creating a crowdfunding weekend as an event series. We've been like in Boston, Houston. We just went, came back from Hawaii and things like that. From that, we met a, a tech guy. That, that is really good. And we say we have this idea for tech, Prefundia, and he's like, I'm on board. So now we have a partner. Now tech is accessible to us. So now we're doing tech. But it wasn't back then, so we weren't doing tech because we just didn't know how to do it. It was too expensive, and we didn't have the connections. Am I running out of time here? Okay, yeah, like two or three minutes. Two minutes, yeah. Um, so does Kickstarter, like, say you have similar... You have two people come up with similar ideas. Uh -huh. Do they tell you if someone has one very similar, you can't put it up, or? Well, in fact, um, let me show you this. Someone created this uh, metal dice, and they're all fairly similar here. Here's a 14-year-old that uh, just created precision metal dice, and that raised 153000 bucks. But dice is not new, right? It's just a, it's a sure. dice. There you have it. So uh, you can make almost the exact same thing. They want it to be creative. So even if this is something that already exists, really, they still want to see your thought process. So the ones that, that we've done that already exist something similar, um, here's an example. Uh, or not. We did this uh, tie that already existed. We just saw it and we thought it was cool, so we did it. And um, they want to see your thought process, like your drawings, your design, and things like that, to make sure that you came up with the idea independent of what's currently being out, done out there, which you can kind of fake, but anyway. Great. OK, so any last, last question? If not, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I think the best way, just email me, daniel at prefundia.com. There you go. But I'm more happy to help if you have products you want to launch. Here's the only thing that I would say to finish is if you have something, an idea that you kind of want, want to see if it's going to work, try to make money today. You can, you can make money today if you wanted to with that idea. You can pre-sell. You can walk in and say, I have, a problem that's going to s I have a solution that's going to solve a big problem of yours, but I'm going to need X amount of dollars. And actually, real quick, a quick story. We had a couple of students that walked into the museum at BYU and said, how do you do this? And I'm not going to get into detail because I don't want to tell uh, in public their idea. But they said, oh, here's a problem they have. Well, we can build a solution for you, but it's going to cost you 20 grand. And they said, deal. Here's 20 grand. Build it for us. Awesome, right? You can make money today without having anything to show them. So uh, even if you're going to corporate, just make sure that you're always trying to mitigate the risk that comes from doing something innovative and something new. OK, thanks for your time. Thank you.